chapter 51, verse 17 is where we're going to start at in a minute here. Let everybody know. Stand up, O Jerusalem, which has drunk at the hand of the Lord the cup of his fury. Thou hast drunken the dregs of the cup of trembling and wrung them out. There is none to guide her among all the sons whom she hath brought forth. Neither is there any that taketh her by the hand of all the sons that she hath brought up. These two things are come unto thee. Who shall be sorry for thee? Desolation and destruction, and the famine, and the sword, by whom shall I comfort thee? Thy sons have fainted, thy, they lie at the head of all the streets, as a wild bull in a net. They are full of the fury of the Lord, the rebuke of thy God. Um, so, uh, looks like God has left them to um, punishment. And it says uh, in 19, who shall be sorry for thee? Um, he's not going to be sorry for them because we saw at the beginning of this that it was their own fault. It says in 19, they have, he's talking to the nation of Israel here, the Jewish nation. 19, he says, you drank the cup of my fury. Uh, that was the judgment he put, put on them for Babylon, Egypt, Syria, captivity. Desolation, destruction, and it ain't gonna be over yet, unfortunately. But uh, basically, it's their own fault. Twenty-one through twenty-three, Nancy. saying is he's kind of prophesying here looking back at the way he's and Isaiah prophesied during I believe uh, let me see was he, I believe it was the fourth captivity but he's saying okay you were afflicted and drunk but not with wine but with their wicked ways is what they were afflicted with and he said I'm going to, you're told me he's going to suffer from the previous verses and then he said verses 17 to 19 
and he tells them what's going to happen after that done and stuff. We just want to take away that fury and that trickling cup. And he's going to afflict the ones that afflicted them. Verse 23 says, and he will cause the destruction of the Babylonian Empire. That's kind of the way I read that. And he comes. He's just giving, he's telling them what's going to happen here. Verse 17 through 9, 17 through 20, he tells them, hey, suffer a lot, but then in the next three verses he tells them, hey, I'm going to bring you back. I'm going to do away with your, forgive, forgive, do away with your suffering and then I'm going to take this in your shoe. And the reason he punished them was because of their idolatry and refusal to follow his words and laws. Alright. Any comments or questions on that? Hey, this uh, Isaiah, let me give you what I, kind of my interpretation. I've read commentaries and people comment on Isaiah. So much of Isaiah, they try to make everything in it sound like it's Christ, but it becomes a stretch and difficult at times. Now, 53, and there are sections that are, we mentioned some of those. In this section, I, some of them even think this is Christ and another church coming on, but I think. The first verse says, hey, you need to give, you know, it says, put on my beautiful garments and, uh, and no more pain will come to you. Let me look at that again. Okay, what now? Yeah, I, I think that's what he's saying. Me, what he's saying is you're going to have to be we're going to get he previously told in those verses in the last chapter he's going to deliver it and I think now he's telling them holy you're going to have to have greater purity you're going to have to have people around you. and where he talks the last verse in that verse 1 where he says there shall come unto thee the uncircumcised and the unclean now that's a difficult section there because I think is they're talking about the Gentiles coming in or is he just talking about the wicked Jews coming back? So I, I'm not for sure. Anybody got any comments on that? To me, it kind of sounds more like those people in the previous chapter that had put them under that had put them under um, captivity and so forth and had been tormenting them. That he's saying that those people are no longer going to come into your cities. And verse three here kind of goes back to the first part of 51 again. Ye have sold yourselves for naught, and ye shall be redeemed without money. And so their redemption is going to be by God's hand. Yeah. yeah, he might have somebody else come in and do it, but it's going to be by God's hand. And he didn't sell them. They sold themselves. Yes. I know it's a little deeper. It was by their own iniquities. Yeah. But uh, that first verse, and then in... in Verse 2, where it says, Shake thyself from the dust and arise, set down, O Jerusalem. Loose thyself from the bands of thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion. I think he's maybe preaching to him that, hey, you need to straighten up here. Your captive daughter of Zion. Those bands will be released. You know, I often wonder these people, some of this was very figured at the time. But when we've gone by 26, 2800 years' time, 
going from a culture that's totally different from ours, these messages, going through uh, languages that are different than ours, and what we've got at the end of the road, I think the people reading that at that time would have a much better concept of what was being said than we could ever have hoped to have. And I'm sure if we could read it in the original Hebrew language, it would be even if we knew the Hebrew, original Hebrew, it would be much more clear and concise than what it is today. We can get the meaning and the concept, but sometimes it's much more difficult to come through all those different barriers. Plus, I think a person, I used to think, you know, a person from the Middle East could probably understand this better even than we can today because of their cultures are still much the same, you know, the way they do things. But uh, I think it's pretty clear to He's telling them uh, to me, verse 1, hey, get your act together. Wait, come out of that sleep and get yourself together. Verse 2, shake off the dust and everything. Let's get back into the action here. In verse 3, he says, you sold yourselves, you caused it yourself, and I'm going to redeem you. It ain't going to cost you nothing. How's that sound for a Western Oklahoma version? What do you think, little Bill? Well, yeah. You kind of remind me of Bill. <laughs> talking about their history there. You know, they were going into Egypt to stay there. And they were oppressed there. The Assyrians took them and oppressed them. And they were named, their name, when his name was blasphemed every day. I'm not for sure that he's talking about the Israelis, Israel, blaspheming those people or the people that were their captors. But my guess is a lot of the Jews are blaspheming God for what the oppression is going through. I think it was a combination of people all around there, but uh, his own people had a lack of faith. And that's, that's kind of why he's bringing them out of captivity is to let them know that he is still there and he is still caring for them. That's the purpose of verse 6, where he says, You shall know my name, and they will know that he is the one that did it. All right, now, I can tell you clearly, without a doubt, we're switching gears here. In chapter in verse 7, we're going to be talking about Christ. So, uh, let me see. Earl, you. Uh, you want to read this uh, 7 through 10, Annette? Okay. I do the Lord. I bought him my hands. I see the him that from the spirit guidings. The published things that from the spirit guidings of people. And that uh, published. Wait just a minute, Deb. We'll have you read a little more. That's verse there. Now that's got to be Christ. And you want to know why I know it's Christ? Because in Romans 10, verse 15, Paul quotes that. Uh, someone go there and read that for me. Romans 10, 15. We'll let Nancy appoint, appoint her that. Wait a minute, Nancy. Okay, we're going to read 
a couple more verses than that. Read this in 8, 9, and 10. Sometimes, and this is one of those times I've talked about dual prophecy, those verses could be talking about their return from captivity, or they actually could be turned talking about the time of Christ. Either way. He's got Romans 15, 10? Yeah, those, uh, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 15. You just let you. Yeah. <coughs> And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. Okay, that's that. So that's a quotation he's quoting there. Now, the interesting thing I want to bring out in this book, we quoted that. You know, sometimes there seems to be quite a bit of variance between uh, the Old Testament and the New, especially the King James. Quote, the King James translators, they quoted from the original Hebrew language, the way it was written at that time. In the New Testament, the, the writers there quote from the Septuagint, which was they, you know, what, about 150 years before the it was translated into Greek, so they quote out of the Greek. So actually, some of this divergence you see is not existent. Because they quote actually from the Septuagint, because that was the version that was used at that time. The message is the same, sometimes the wording is slightly different. But they always quoted from the Septuagint, and King James translator used the Hebrew rather than the Septuagint, the Greek language, the way he translated. Well, well, wasn't it all like, wasn't it the corn I agree that they used? Yeah, the, um, the, 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 you know, which was the language of the Problems are often with languages. You've got some people that go into captivity in Babylon. They speak Chaldean in Babylon. And you've got people who speak Hebrew. After 70 years there, they're going to come out with a lot of Hebrew, with Chaldean words in their language. And so that happened every time they were conquered by somebody. And over time, you know, the languages took, our English language has words that are certain words that are. Languages all over the world, you know, many of them. So that's kind of the way they ended up in Koine, I think, what they call it, Greek. It's a little bit different than the pure Greek. Plus, they probably had some Babylonian other words at this period mixed in or later with their language. So languages are, that's why, you know, medical reports, it used to be all a military manual. You know, people used to study Latin. Everybody studied Latin. Even the priests and things used to be Latin experts. The Catholic Church always did their mass in Latin. And the reason is Latin was a dead language. No ad words added, no words subtracted. So everything was translated to Latin. And that way, 50 or 100 or 200 years from now, that word would be the same as it originally did. You know, we have words here, and Dale wrote this out a lot of times. It had different meanings, and the meaning changed over time. You talk about the word gay. 
we used to be in the 20s and 30s, you said someone was gay, that meant they were happy and, you know, enjoyable and, you know, that kind of thing. The now gay means an entirely different thing at this point in time. And so if you were reading something with that, you would say they're, they are gay, then it would mean they were a very happy person. Nice to be around now would mean something was sexual orientation. So that's why Latin was that. So that's, and I don't know how I ended up on this subject, but it's kind of, you kind of need to know in the difficulties of languages because it does change. But that's why they're a good heap to be really Greek scholars. All right. These verses 7 through 10, actually, other than 7, uh, 8, 9, and 10, that's almost to me like it was referring to the nation of Israel. But also in verse 10, it says, All of the last part of it says, All the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. And that kind of points me more to this Christ. Everyone's going to see that salvation. So I think that's still running pretty messianic to me. All right, little Bill, your turn. Read us 10 to 10, 11, 12. No, 11, 12, 13. Read us the rest of the chapter. Okay. Depart ye, depart ye. Go ye out from the earth. Touch no unclean thing. Go ye out of the midst of her. Be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. For ye shall not go out with haste, nor go by flight. For the Lord will go before you, and God of Israel will be your free reward. Let, let's stop right there. <coughs> I think here he's talking direct. Actually, all of us in the nation of Israel, some of the plots of Christ. Here he's talking, okay, go out, be clean, be straight, do everything right. Don't be unclean. And the God of Israel will be your reward. All right, read us the rest of it. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. As many were stung at the his visage. Actually, I bring him on glasses. His visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. So shall he sprinkle many nations. The kings shall shut their mouths at him. For that which had not been told them shall they see, and that which they had not heard shall they consider. Okay. You think that's enough? That the witnessing of the witnessing of Christ. Yeah, yeah, that, that's all. That would be it, it all has to, because there were many nations. That were never taught about Christ, but they knew who he was. They knew from the things that they'd seen, from the miracles that they'd heard about, even. They may not have heard him directly, but they heard about him. That's definitely talks about my servant Christ. You know, the Jews nowadays are through the history, they've always claimed that, uh, well, that servant is, that's either uh, Jeremiah or Moses, or they always have somebody else that put in there, but. When you look at what's given, he shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. I don't see any of the prophecy that Moses himself would want that kind of description. You know, I think this has to be Well, his visage was so large. Yeah. That Christ was uh, very comely in his appearance, and then he was marred on the cross, being whipped. And, you know, his appearance would have been marred then in his form. But he wasn't referred to as comely. No. In the next chapter, they did. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Well, when they said uh, Mark was astonished at the his vision was so marred by more than any man in this form, more than the sons of men. I probably think really that's what he got on the cross there in the way his form was. His condition was. Yeah, but he was just. I mean, he was Homely No, 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 no. Homely and I'm going to, Earl, come on. Tell <laughs> the truth. Homely <laughs> is, is it homely very attractive? Okay. Go down to the 
26th chapter, verse 2. This is definitely talking about Christ. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when you shall see him, there is no beauty we should desire him. Yeah, he has no, no comeliness. No, he has, he's not attractive. Well, gee, I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm wrong. That was all of us. Why didn't you help me out early and just make a fool out of myself completely? Because he knew you were wrong. I didn't think you were any help. You're right. I stand totally corrected. Okay. We're right. So, uh, no, no, no. Okay. Yeah, his appearance was marred. Visage. Okay. Any other questions on that? Uh, one thing I might notice. Verse 15, he says, so shall he sprinkle many nations. And that could mean with the gospel message, Lord Christ, but I really think it's about his blood and cleansing them. That's what the sprinkling is, because at that time, the sprinkling of blood was a purifying blood. So I think that's what he talks he's in the All right, whose turn is free? Patrick, read a while, and let me rest. Uh, sorry, I need a moment. My glasses. Are okay, Earl. Hard. Nancy, you're back to you. Read us the first three verses and then you give us a report. Because the first one is all important. Who has believed your report? And your report? Who has, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of the dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid as if as it were as it were our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. What do you think of that? Chris, you got anything? Yeah, you, I missed you on the read. You <laughs> missed you. You missed section next time. <coughs> well, that's just talking about Christ there, and we can absolutely verify that because look at John 12, 38. Little Bill, you get John 12, 38, and Earl, you get uh, Romans 10, 16 for us. Read that. Read there, Because this is quoted in the New Testament. So we know it's Christ. Of course, he has no form of covenant. That's that means nothing to be desired in him. He wasn't, you know, like Arnold Schwarzenegger showing up on the scene or something. Verse 3, it also says, We hid our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. That's Christ. That's basically what the Jewish nation did to him. Most of them. All right. John 12 38. 12 38. That the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Obey the gospel for Isaiah said, Lord, who has believed our report? Isaiah 53 definitely is about Christ on this chapter. If anybody asked about the Christ, the definitive chapter on Christ in the Old Testament, there you have those prophets again doing it. I'm quoting them. So, Chris, you're going to get to read. Read till you get tired. Yeah, and this section is all about Christ. Surely he had poured our griefs and carried our sorrows, and yet we did not see him as stricken, slain of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, and chastised for our sins. Of our people were broken, and with his 
Said him to smite that beast to smitten. So there are sins to be removed. God had to have something to remove our sins. We weren't able to furnish it for him. The one that we got that God didn't give. Everything on this earth God created. We couldn't produce anything to justify ourselves of our own accord, other than a perfect life. And none of us leave that. So uh, God had to put him there for it. He offered his son, which is actually himself, to pay the debt for man. Now that's where they get to talk about the love of God or the love of Christ there. He decided, okay, I want to save these folks, so I'm going to have to pay their debts. Some of you may do that with kids or someone you care about or something, you know, you pay their debts. Because you love them. Uh, some people, most people, many people, I think the most part, look at their real parents. If there was a choice between your life and theirs, I think most parents would probably have sacrificed their own life to save their child. God paid the debt. And that's, I think, something just over. This always seems so complicated, but God, if you look at all the creatures he has around the throne and all these other angels, he has to show justice. If you're a ruler, you've got to show justice and be a good ruler. You can't let somebody buy something without treating everybody fair. You've got to be just. And God had to be just. And that's why he said, okay, I'm going to provide a sacrifice myself. I'm going to bear the cost of that. You want to read a few more, Chris? And basically that stuff, you know, he was bruised for iniquity and the iniquity, all our sins are laid on him. So. <coughs> he can stand for freedom, for judgment, and who should declare his generations? For he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was there any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord. Anybody got any points you'd like to bring out there? Uh, I think it's uh, in Peter, uh, there was no deceit or guile found in his mouth. I think that's 1 Peter 2.22. I've got a reference there to that. Yeah, these dictions are great Bibles if you ever have them. They, they, they do a good job. See, you can make me look really smart. <laughs> <laughs> but not come there. <laughs> no chance of that. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, anything else? Uh, uh, he was cut off the land of living at his death. Uh, it says in verse 8, who, uh, second, uh, he was taken from prison and from judgment and he shall declare his generation. Earl, what do you think about that? Who shall declare the generation? He had no offspring. What? He had no offspring. That's kind of a simple approach I took to it. 
But he will have seed because that seed will be the gospel followers, the Christians. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see who that is. Uh, nine says he made his grave with the rich, with the wicked, and with the rich. I think the rich is rich is probably the, uh, the wicked with the two malefactors at the cross with him, and the rich man was probably Joseph of Arimathea with the grave scepter he put in. Verse 10 said, yet it pleased the Lord. I don't think that's a pleasure type of pleased. I think it's something that it was what he knew was necessary. It's satisfying for the Lord. It's satisfying with his purpose. Right. Yeah, good, good. Uh, verse 12 says, I will divide a portion with the great, and then shall divide the spoil with the strong. Surely when you talk about that, you're talking about earthly things. It's just saying Christ will have a great seat. Even though he was numbered with the transgressions, he said the transgressions in verse 12, it says, which he was on the cross to the end of the be. Amen. All right, let's go to verse 54. Any questions on that? Now, this chapter here is going to, we're going to be talking about the Gentiles coming into the flock. Uh, and then read us a couple verses there. Thank you, Pharaoh. Jews and Holy 
you're going to need a bigger tent because there's more people that are going to worship Jehovah, the God. And then he's talking about, and he may just be talking about uh, Christ there, but in, in verse 3 it said, they shall break forth on the right and on the left, and that's Christianity being spread, and inherit the Gentiles. And that would be Christ, Christ God, and through Christ inherited the Gentiles, brought them in. And may the spiritually dead or desolate cities be Christian cities. And uh, that's kind of what I think he's talking about. He's actually here, this, this, this section here, I believe, he's talking to the Jews, but he's sending them a message about the Gentiles. In other words, that <coughs> most of the Jews did not accept Christ, but many did. Large the tent. So he's talking, he's writing to the Jews, but he's putting the message there about the Gentiles coming in. And I think we'll stop at verse 5 there. Good job, Amen.